In a small village in China, there was a candy maker who was really passionate about his job. Selling candy in the streets was his way of taking care of his family. One day, work was slow, and he decided to kill some time by taking out his bamboo flute and playing his favorite childhood song. Once he did that, the unbelievable happened. Children and adults alike have gathered around to listen to him play. Obviously, they didn't leave empty-handed. Most of them bought candy. He was really surprised to see how this simple yet captivating activity has managed to get people's attention. The old man's name was Li Ming. He lived 7,000 years ago in China, and he's the first person that we know of to have used neuromarketing as a tool to sell his product. I mean, the guy was doing marketing before we even called it marketing, because nowadays we encounter music everywhere in retail environments, from fancy restaurants to pubs to even the ice cream truck. The access to knowledge that we've been having until this point has demonstrated why these techniques work so well. And yes, no doubt, the music's effect on the human brain is undeniable. However, in Li Ming's case, there's a different catch. Did you guys get it? The catch is in the type of music that he played. He played his favorite childhood songs, which, for kids, these are just fun little songs to play. But on adults, they have a different effect, triggering memories of childhood, nostalgia, feelings of possibly love and care. This way, Li Meng was able to create an association between products and feelings that are so coveted by adults. How do I know this? Well, just like Li Meng, I create associations between products and feelings for a living. I have dedicated the past years of my life to building and studying strong brands internationally. I have spoken to brand professionals from over 100 organizations located in 31 countries, five continents, and one planet. And today, I'm happy to be here with you to share the behind the scenes of how the big brands influence your life after the register rings, and what can we do as consumers to make more informed choices. Something that I find fascinating in Li Ming's story is the emotional power that drives the purchasing decision. Neuromarketing, which is this incredible science that combines neurology, the study of the brain, and marketing, has demonstrated that 95% of the decision-taking process happens unconsciously. One, a very telling example of this is the way Nestle managed to get coffee to Japan. After the Second World War, the plan was to capitalize on this largely untapped market. They created a terrific product, it was priced reasonably, it performed amazing in test tests. Sounds like a great plan, doesn't it? Well, it didn't work. Matter of fact, despite marketing's best efforts, nothing appeared to be working. They hired a psychoanalyst, who during his investigations found out that whereas Japanese had a strong emotional connection to tea, they had no emotional connection with coffee. What do you think the Nestle team did here? Because they had an amazing approach. These guys are simply genius. Instead of selling coffee to a tea drinking culture, they have reframed the problem by marketing coffee-flavored sweets to Japanese youngsters, who by the time they would grow up, they would get so used to the taste of coffee, linking it to childhood memories, therefore, subsequently, becoming coffee drinkers when adults. Sometimes, their parents would even sample the sweets they bought for their children and end up liking the taste as well. Nowadays, Japan is in the top five coffee-buying countries in the world in terms of dollar value. So what can we learn from this example? What we can learn from Nestle's example is that no matter how much we'd want to believe that logic and rationality 
are the foundations behind our purchasing decisions that is, in fact, very far away from the truth. Logic may whisper, but emotions are the little voices in our heads screaming, buy it. In other words, we do not think our way to buying, we feel our way to buying. Let's look at the facts. My mom is in the audience today. Thanks, mom. So, uh, again, we do not think our way to buying. We feel our way to buying. I encourage you to look at the facts. Here are the facts. The iPhone is just a smartphone. Levi's are just jeans. And Birkin is just a bag. Yet we've got people going out of their way to buy these specific products from these specific brands. The question is how? How do the big brands do this? In order to answer this question, we need to look at the very definition of a brand because the answer lies partially in that definition. And in order to understand better what a brand is, let's start with what a brand isn't. A brand is not a logo, a brand is not a slogan, a brand isn't even a product. A brand is the gut feeling that people get about your product, service, or organization. A brand is a reputation. One of my all-time favorite studies here, it's a, an experiment that was done in 2004, and it got a bunch of volunteers to drink either Coke or Pepsi, while their brains were scanned in order to find out which parts of it became activated. Uh, but I think that before we get into the politics of which one is better, you know, I'm quite curious to see, what do you guys prefer? Do you like Coke or do you like... Raise your hands if you like Coke. Okay, all right. And the rest like Pepsi? You have the right to be wrong. Bombastic side eye. I, I, I always say this for my little sister because we have like a connection while saying it. So, again, we got the volunteers, we have the brain scanning devices on. They started with a blind taste. They didn't know what they were about to drink. The results? Slightly over 50% prefer the taste of Pepsi over Coke. Now, they repeated the same exact experiment, just this time, the participants were told exactly what they were about to drink right before taking a sip. The results? Suddenly, over 75% of the participants preferred the taste of Coke over Pepsi. Even more surprisingly here, the part of the brain that is responsible for emotions, feelings, and memories became highly activated while drinking Coca-Cola. So what does this study really show us? This study demonstrates what happens to our brains unconsciously while drinking Coca-Cola. And if you take a look at their communication over the years, it makes perfect sense. They have implanted our brains with thoughts, feelings, and memories. For extra fun, take more than one. So what is the secret weapon that these brands have that has this effect on people's minds? A few weeks ago, I bought myself a pair of professional Nike running shoes. I needed them in order to feel more comfortable while running long distances. Um, there's just one problem here. I don't run, let alone, let alone long distances. You know the saying, if you see me running, you better run too, because it means I'm being chased. So why did I buy the shoes? What happened here? For the same reason why I set my alarm every day at 6 a.m., knowing well that I will be hitting the snooze button at least three times. My mom is looking at me. Don't look at me like this. We all do this. What Nike sold me wasn't a product. They sold me a feeling, a piece of the puzzle of the person I want to become. I would love to get up early in the morning, go for a 30-minute run before work. What Apple, Coca-Cola, and Nike have to offer is far more important than a product. In fact, their true product is identity. They offer us a tool to influence what people think about us. Take a look at their advertisements. Do they justify their products? 
Does Nike tell us about how resistant their soul is? No, not really. In fact, we do this. And by us, I mean me and you, the consumers. You know, when I tell people that I work in marketing, this always comes with a bad reputation. There is this assumption that all marketers are liars, which is not true. I tell people all the time. It's not true, not in today's world, where in order for a product to perform well long term, it really needs to prove good quality. All marketing does is just drive attention to the product. So when I get this reaction, when people tell me we are liars, I tell them, we don't need to lie. In fact, you do it quite well. As humans, we lie to ourselves on a daily basis. But that's okay. We tend to believe in things that are not true, or in other words, things are true just because we believe in them. Think about it. If you love a car brand, you will love driving their cars, by default. And if you think a bottle of expensive wine tastes better than a cheaper one, then just, that's, how, that's just how it's gonna be. Neuromarketing has shown that once we as consumers make a choice that deepens the relationship we have with the brand, identifying with it like family. And once we identify with the brand, it can shape the way we behave. Did you know that a whopping 60% of Americans think of their car as a full-fledged member of their family? It's me, my husband, and the Honda. In fact, half of the American car owners would describe their car's personality as trustworthy, fun, or charming. I think I'm not shocking anyone here when I tell you that every second American car owner regularly talks to their car. Any ideas what this conversation might sound like? They usually start up with the driver encouraging the car to go faster or that together they can make it up the hill. With the bond so deep, no wonder why we take it personally. An attack on the brand is an attack on ourselves. So having all of this information, what can we do as consumers to make more informed choices? First, it is important to understand and be aware of the power and influence that brands hold on us. Then it is important to pause and ask yourself, okay, now why am I buying this product? You will find that a lot of the times the answer lies within our fundamental need as humans for social acceptance and support. What once were churches and social clubs, now brands are stepping in as pillars of our identity. And you might tell me, you know what, Catalina? I'm not into brands. In fact, I don't even like brands. It's okay, to that I'll tell you, well, that is actually your brand, the anti-brand brand. So the next time you go shopping, and you're face to face with a product, ask yourself, who is looking at who? Are you looking at the product or is the product looking at you? Thank you. <laughs>